Now, today we are in part four of a series called With the End in Mind. And uh, this is a series which is based on the first Thessalonian. It's a little book in the Bible. And we've been looking at how do we live each day? How do we wait well? Because eternity is coming for us all, okay? Either by, because of death or because of the second coming of Christ. And so you would have heard over the course of the series, but if you're new today, let me summarize what this book is kind of about so far. Uh, we've got Paul, the Apostle Paul. He's, he's written a letter to um, a new church full of new Christians. He did set up this church, but he was only with them for three weeks. In, those, in that time, he, he taught them all that he could about Jesus, about this new life in Christ. But then suddenly he had to leave because there were threats made against his life. So he leaves. Then he hears that the church was also being persecuted and he's worried about them. So he writes to them because he's heard from Timothy, someone he sent there, that they're actually doing really well. This church is doing really well, that in the midst of suffering, they're loving well and they're standing firm. That's where we're at already. And so last week, Pastor Jason, my husband, preached an incredible message about standing, not bowing. And uh, and these are the last two verses of chapter three, just so we can link it all before we get into our topic. Paul prays, he says, and may the Lord make your love for one another and for all the people grow and overflow. May he, as a result, make your heart strong and blameless and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes again. So chapter three finishes with with Paul praying that they would grow in holiness and love. And now in chapter four, he's going to talk about three ways he wants them to grow in these areas. He's going to talk about how they need to grow in sexuality, in work, and in death, their understanding of death. That's the first three things you can fill in on your notes. Sexuality, work, and death. So today I'm going to talk about sexuality, verses one to eight. Uh, Pastor John is going to cover from verse 13 onwards into chapter 5 on death um, and the second coming of Christ. And work, which is verses 9 to 12, it needed its own week. Trust me, we would be here till kingdom come if I went there today. So um, I had to cut that part out of my message. And and I hope that we'll be able to cover that even next year sometime because it is a great relevant topic. So I want to give a heads up today that uh, this message is PG-13. Okay, it's, I wouldn't say, if I had kids this age, I wouldn't say that this is an appropriate message for children. Uh, So if you need to, I've asked the kids team to leave check-in open if you need to go and check them in uh, for that now. But it's up to you what you want to do. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, he writes in many of his letters about sexuality. This isn't the only place we find it. He, He does it a lot because he understood that sex is one of the most powerful forces and urges in our humanity, that we are sexual beings, okay? We are sexual beings. So whether we are married or unmarried, whether we are dating or not dating, new to faith or mature in faith, this is a very relevant topic in our culture or in in any culture in any time. So let's get started in verse 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Verse 1. Finally, brothers and sisters, we instructed you on how to walk and to please God as in fact you are living. So Paul starts by saying, he's saying that that faith starts with a step, but then it needs to become a walk. Okay, it starts with a step and then it needs to become a walk. God is not satisfied if all we do is take that first step. Okay, just like a parent wouldn't be happy if their child only ever took one step. You know, and that happens sometimes with your toddlers. They take one step and then they don't do anything for months. And you're despairing, will they ever walk, you know? But, and so we wouldn't be satisfied because the first step is supposed to lead to walking. And in that walk, that walk where we take one step of obedience after the other, that walk, that our highest calling is to please God. So it's a walk and and our calling is to please God in it. And pleasing God may not be what you think it is. 
Pleasing God is, is not a list of rules. It's not a list of do's or don'ts. It's who we are. It's, it's a lifestyle that we choose. Pleasing God isn't trying to earn his approval or his love because we are already approved of. We are already accepted and welcomed into his family, saved by grace. So pleasing God instead comes when we understand how loved we are, when we love God and it delights our heart to bring joy to him. So when we love someone, we wanna make them happy, don't we? Now, as a parent, I, I don't want my kids to obey me because they're scared of me. They're scared of me yelling at them or punishing them. I want them to obey me because they know that whatever I do, it's for their best interest and because I have their wholeness in mind. So if I say to them, don't eat those cookies before dinner, that they would know I'm not trying to just take the cookie away from them. I'm trying to, uh, pr to protect, preserve their appetite for dinner. Nothing's wrong with the cookie. It's just at the wrong time. And so this is God's heart. Not that, that we're, that we're um, scared of him, but that we would uh, obey him because we love him and because we understand his heart from us. And so this is the whole motivation behind our obedience in our sexuality is that we would desire, desire to please God, not as a tick box to not feel guilt. No, no, because he is our heavenly father and our highest calling, our highest desire in this life is to please him. It goes on to say in verse one, now we ask you and urge you and the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. And so Paul's saying, you're doing well, but there's more. There's no arriving. So can I say to the most mature person in the room, there's no arriving. There's no arriving here. And so Paul is like a personal trainer who's annoying, but they're for you and they're urging you and they're grinding you and they're pressuring you to keep going for more. There's more. And they're trying to help you accomplish your task, your goal, which is to please God more. Now, I want you to understand that, that for those that were hearing this message where it's about to go, what he was about to say was gonna put pressure on them. It was the first time they had ever heard maybe teaching like this before. And maybe for some of you today, this is gonna be your first time hearing on teaching about sex like this before. And it might feel uncomfortable. It might feel like pressure, but it's all to help us. It's all to help us reach our goal, which is that we wanna please God. He says, verse two, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And so Paul's saying, I didn't, I'm not giving my opinion here. I'm speaking with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has authority over every aspect of our lives, both hidden and visible. And so these new Christian converts, uh, they, in this Thessalonian church, all they knew was living for self. All they knew was just doing what pleased them. And then all of a sudden they start learning that, hey, it's not what I want, what, it's what God wants. And so the question is, who has authority over our life? Who has authority over our life? And, and they had to determine, just like we do, are we gonna live by external, external truth, the word of God, or are we gonna live by internal feelings? Because in our world, in our culture, it's if it feels good, then it can't be wrong. It's not adultery, I'm just falling in love. If it feels good, then how can it be wrong? And no one is allowed to say otherwise. If you feel a certain way, even if it's not based in reality, then no one can tell you otherwise. But it says in verse three, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. It's God's will that you should be sanctified. Now we can spend a lot of time 
worrying about the will of God. What's God's will for this part of my life? And who should I marry? And what's God's will for my career? And where should I live? And, and we want to know the specific will of God. But here it's making it very clear that in, above all those things, what's important is that we need to know that God's will is that we would be sanctified, which means that we would become holy. And that's why our theme this year was, this is holy ground. Because holiness is not only a gift, it's a state that we stand in before God, justified and righteous before Him because of Christ. Holiness is a gift, but it's also a process. It's a walk. Yeah, it's a walk. It's a process. It's, a, it's that we are called, as it said, to become more and more more and more like God, that we would talk like Him, that we would think like Him, that we would love like Him, that we would respond like Him, less of us and more like Him. And there's no arriving in that. There's never any arriving in that. And then it says, it's God's will that you should be sanctified. And here it is, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Now, firstly, um, Avoid is a weak translation because when we think of avoid, we think of moderation. Just try and stay away from it. But that's not what this word actually meant. It means to have a clean break. It means total abstinence from sexual immorality. So there are certain things, we don't really use these words, immorality. So there are certain things that are immoral, but they're not illegal. Now, illegal means that it's wrong in the eyes of the law, but immoral means that it's wrong in the eyes of God. And so sometimes we can say, oh, but it's not illegal. It's not a crime, but it's wrong in the eyes of God. It's immoral. So the difference is like this. If Let's say you're dating someone or you're married even and, and that other person cheats on you. Can you call the police? No. Can you call them up and say, can you come over here and taser that person? No, you can't because it's immoral, but it's not, sorry, it's immoral, but it's not illegal, okay? And so um, God's standards are much higher than the law, because God's heart is for our wholeness, our wholeness. So it goes on in verse four to five, and it says that each of you should learn to control your body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans or, or the, un, the non-Christians who do not know God, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. I want you to note here that this, this passage doesn't say don't have sex. It doesn't say don't have sex, but it says, and point number one is that sex has a context. Sex has a context. There is some sexual behaviour that is immoral and there is some sexual behaviour that is holy and honourable. Yeah? So the context of sex throughout the whole Bible is consistent. It is heterosexual marriage. One man and one woman who make a covenant with each other. There's no exceptions to this. It's not confusing, it's easy. Therefore, any sexual behavior that happens outside of marriage is immoral wrong in the eyes of God. So adultery in heart or in action, pornography, sexual behavior, any sexual behavior before marriage would all fall into the category of sexual immorality. Now, when Paul was writing this to understand the context that he was writing in, it was a Greek and, and Roman uh, culture that was saturated with sex probably like our culture, okay, not unlike us. And, and who he was writing to, not Jews, he was writing to Gentiles. So just anyone who's not a Jew is who he was writing to. And it was very normal or even encouraged in some circles that men would, would have um, many sexual partners. 
So they would have their wives who would give them legitimate heirs. They would have a mistress who would be their companion. They would have their servants who had to be like readily available to, to give sex whenever the master desired it. And then they had prostitutes. And so the men would feed off all these different women. And Paul comes along to these new converts and says, that's not going to happen anymore. You're going to have sex with one person, your spouse, and to the many saying, you're going, to have, you're going to sleep with one woman and she's going to be the mother to your children. She's going to be your companion. She's going to be uh, your lover. She's going to be your equal. And this was radical for them. And maybe for you today, this, this feels, whoa, like what is that? Um, it, and for them, it was radical that sex, all sexual things as it falls into this large category is, is only for marriage. And Paul says the reason why, the reason why that is, is that sex outside of marriage for a Christian is because it is unholy. It is unholy. Paul gives us a theological basis for sexuality, not just a cultural one, a theological basis for our sexuality. He says it's wrong because it's inconsistent with God's character. And when we know God, we know that God's nature is to only offer intimacy in the the safety of commitment. Whole body commitment goes with whole life commitment. Think about God's covenant with us. It is a picture of marriage. God completely and totally commits himself to us. He gives his life for us. He gave his body for us for us. And then in turn, when we choose to give our life to Christ, we then give him our body too. In Romans 12 verse 1 says, I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, whole, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. So it goes life first and then body second. Now it's saying, what he's saying, Paul is saying is that non-Christians, because they do not know God, Because they do not know God, they think it's okay to have physical intimacy without life commitment. But for those of us who know Christ, we know that he never does intimacy without commitment. And he is asking us that in this area of our life, in our sexuality, that we would reflect his nature. So this is for Christians, okay? This is not for for those out in the world. It's saying when we know Christ, that we, we understand we need to reflect his nature. Timothy Keller says it like this, and I've sort of paraphrased it, but he says that the pagan or the, the unchristian approach to sex, it rips body and soul apart. It says, I will be physically one with you, but in every other way, I won't be one with you. And so it's not whole, it's, not, it's fragmenting, it's incoherent. So the Bible says life and, and body go together, the commitment. So not only is sex outside of marriage unholy before God, but it is also, he says, dishonouring. It harms others. It's not loving. It's not truly loving to give one without the other, to take body with not, to, not giving our life. So sex is a bit like a fire. Sex is like fire. It's hot. Yeah, it's hot, it's, it's powerful, it's good, it's useful. But it also can easily get out of control. It can also burn and cause damage. Now, when you make a campfire on the ground, what do you have to do to make sure it doesn't get out of control? What do you have to do? You have to put a boundary around it, yeah? You have to put a ring around that fire, Now, we can get defensive in this area saying, hey, you know what, this is my business. It's my little private fire over here. And uh, you can't tell me what to do about my little fire. 
But soon, all our little fires are burning down the forest, you know? In fact, in 2022, in Idaho, um, there was a, a fire called um, the Moose Fire, if they can put up the photo, if they, yeah? Yeah. And uh, this fire um, burned down 130,000 acres. It cost $100 million. And very sadly, it took the life of five firefighters. And do you know how it started? One guy. One guy who didn't put a ring around his fire. You see, in the same way, God created marriage to be the ring that contains the fiery passion of sex. God didn't do this to rob us of joy. He did it to protect that joy. And you see, the damage that happens because sex is used outside of its context, it's used outside of marriage, it's it's actually quite staggering. I want you to imagine for a moment, what would happen if the whole world obeyed the Bible in just this one area? Think about what wouldn't exist anymore. The 73 million abortions that take place worldwide every year. Sexual assault and trauma. Sex trafficking and prostitution. The pornography industry. Divorce heartache that's caused by affairs, poverty that's called because someone's left, STDs, sexual addictions, broken relationships, emotional baggage, mental health problems, confusion. Women and children in particular, but even men and marriages would be so much better off if we listen to God's word. And so God doesn't want to rob us of joy. He wants us to, he wants to protect that passion. The passionate lust that it's talking about in verse 4, what it means is excessive desire. Excessive desire. It's when we want to chase pleasure so much that we, that we put it above loving others and pleasing God. We put our needs first. The theologian John Stott, he, he says it's like this. He says, the fact is, and I've put it in your notes, the fact is there is a world of difference between lust and love, between dishonourable sexual practices which use the partner and true lovemaking which honours the partner, between the selfish desire to possess and the unselfish desire to love and cherish and to respect that person. You see, when we chase pleasure above pleasing God, what starts as pleasure often becomes pain. What starts as pleasure becomes pain. It becomes destructive in our lives. So what does this look like? If you are unmarried, what does it look like for for dishonour? What does it look like? How do do we act dishonourably here? You know, what often happens with, with people who are not married is they, we can get caught up, when we like someone, we get caught up in the moment. And when we get caught up in the moment, we fail to consider and to care about the long-term consequences and the well-being of the other person. We don't consider the baggage. We don't consider the patterns we're starting We don't consider the memories and the feelings that linger even when the relationship ends. And so what we do is we rob our future spouse, their future spouse, from what should only belong to them. We're giving, we're taking the body, but we're not giving our life. For married couples, I want to note, because you might think, oh, you can't be dishonorable in marriage. Yes, you can. It's possible for sex to be dishonourable because when we become so focused on one person's pleasure and not the others, when we become so focused on meeting our own needs, maybe becoming demanding or forceful or, or wanting sex but not actually respecting the wholeness of that person and respecting and honouring them as a person, then it becomes dishonourable. And so marriage is not a legalised form of lust. Anything in marriage goes, only if two are consenting and finding it pleasurable. And it's so important 
that we still use restraint so that both are elevated and built up in the marriage with sex. So where are we chasing pleasure? And maybe it started as pleasure, but now it's become destructive. It's become painful. And maybe you can't control it anymore. Paul isn't saying, and I'm not saying, that pleasure is bad. Pleasure is not bad. It's good, but it needs, we need to put our pleasure under a purpose. Can you all say that? Put our pleasure under a purpose. And so that's our next one. Next point is that sex has a purpose. Sex has a context. Sex has a purpose. And our purpose and the purpose for sex is the opposite. It is, it is for it to be holy and honourable. So six purposes or ways that sex can be, be holy and honourable in marriage. Here we are. You can quickly fill them out. Number one, the first thing is that it's fun. Fun. Sex is fun. There is a whole book on the Bible called The Song of Songs that is all about a husband and wife delighting in each other's bodies. Now, in church, we get a bit stiff about this. And uh, we think that it's all about purity, purity, purity. Purity is not the ultimate aim. It's purity before marriage so that in marriage, we can have passion and pleasure. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Number two, children is the second purpose. Genesis 1.28, be fruitful and multiply. Increase in numbers, the Bible says. Number three is oneness. Genesis 2.24, that is why a man leaves his mother and father and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. So sex, literally, neurologically, biochemically, it bonds a husband and wife together. It's a gift and it's a blessing from God. Number four, Genesis, uh, Genesis 4.1, um, sorry, it's knowing, knowing is number four. It says, the man, the man Adam knew his wife Eve intimately. And this word knew actually means that he learned her. He learned her. And I love that. You know, when you're married, you know each other and you can build each other up in a way that no one else can. No matter what happens outside your bubble, you can build each other up through lovemaking. And it's a beautiful picture that, that, that before marriage and then during marriage, no one else should know you that way. There is an intimacy that happens there, a knowing. Number five is protection. 1 Corinthians 7, starting at verse 2, says, Each man should have sex, sexual relations with, with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marriage duty to his wife and likewise to her, the wife to her husband. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. He says, it is good to stay unmarried as I do, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn <laughs> with passion. So it's saying that sex within marriage is a divine remedy against sin. It's better to get married than to burn. Put a ring around it, that's what he's saying. Um, lastly, comfort. There's a story in Second, um, Second Samuel where, where David's child dies and he goes to his wife uh, and it says in verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 24, that he goes to his wife, he comforted his wife and he made love to her. And so sometimes sex is just the, the ministry of just being there with each other in that time, in sorrow. So holiness and honour is the goal, both in marriage and also outside of marriage. So let me talk to those who are unmarried for a moment. We have to remember that holiness and honour, for those of us that are in Christ, that's what I'm talking about today, that it means abstinence to any form of sexual intimacy. It's not moderation. It's a clean break. It's, it's not how much can I get away with. It's a clean break. Now, before I got married, I had some very well-meaning people come up to me and tell me how um, 
they struggled to get over the line. They just made it in time, you know, where they didn't, they, they, they saved intercourse for sex. And, uh, and, but really what, what they're saying is they did everything but intercourse. There are some people that are unmarried that are more experienced in foreplay than even married couples because they've done so much. And so they might be able to say, well, I'm technically a virgin, but broken the, the spirit of that command, which is disciplined holiness over passionate lust. And so the question we have to ask is, is are you controlling your body? Are you controlling the sexual desires or has it started to control you? I want to illustrate this um, using, because you might think, Alyssa, what do you know about this? You and Jason are pastors. I'm sure you've never experienced any of these temptations in your life. Um, But we have. And so we, we sat down together and we talked about how I would share our experience with you today. And um, it might shock some of you, but, but today my aim is to help um, our people that are unmarried, whether you're young or older in life, it doesn't matter. So Jace and I, as I said in my last message, we dated two separate times. The first time was in our early 20s. And during that time, we were sneaking around, lying about it. We were saying we were just friends, but we weren't. We weren't controlling our sexual desires. Now, I want to make it clear, because of what I've just said, we didn't have intercourse. We didn't take our clothes off, but we crossed over into passionate lust. And you know how I knew that? Well, I know because the Bible says it, but I also knew it because I knew I felt guilty. I was hiding it. And I knew it wasn't pleasing my father. And so, my, my father, but also my father. <laughs> so because of that, I would, we would say, oh, we're not going to do that anymore. And we would fall into this condemnation cycle where we'd say we're not going to do it anymore, we'd stay apart for a bit, and then we would fall back into it again. And it was messy it was messy and it was painful and it, and it really left a mark on every area of our life. And because of that, because of other things, we actually had to break it off completely. We didn't speak for two years. And there was a lot of pain because of all that we experienced over a long period of time. So then two years later, we get in contact again and this time everything is different Our highest goal this time is to protect each other and to honour God, honour God above all else. We didn't care about upsetting each other. We just wanted to honour God. This time, we had a purpose to our relationship. We were trying to work out if this was going towards marriage. We weren't just having fun, you know, going with our feelings. We were working out, is something here? And so there was a purpose we protected each other with clear boundaries. We, we didn't give space or opportunity at all for it to go into uncontrolled lust. And if we made any little mistake, we would quickly course correct. We didn't do this because we were pastors or, or because somebody was holding us accountable. We did it because we loved God and we loved each other and we showed our love by honouring God and honouring each other. You see, pleasing God in this area is not easy even when you have two people who love God. It's not easy. But it's so important that we put our pleasure under a purpose. And that's why we say to people, be really careful with dating and being engaged for long periods of time. Because we have to put our pleasure under a purpose It's not natural for it to go on too long. We are sexual beings. It's meant to go somewhere. Intimacy progresses. And so to stay holy before God, to honour each other, we need to make sure that we put a ring around it, that we're heading towards that. And please hear me, my heart is not to condemn you. My heart is to give instruction and clarity where often there isn't in the church. 
and to save. I know a lot of couples struggle with this. As I said, Jason, I struggled and we love God. And, and thankfully, we were able to rewrite our story. And I pray that you can rewrite the story that you've had in your life too. And even more so, because now Paul's going to offer a warning. That's the last point. In verse 6 to 8, a, he gives us a warning about sex. He says, The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and have warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So Paul is saying that sexual sin, it, it's serious because it always harms our relationship with God. It always harms our relationship with God. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15, um, he gives some context. He says, don't you realise that your bodies are parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and then join it to a prostitute? Never. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. It's like a woman who takes drugs when she's pregnant. She disregards and harms the life that is residing within her. And it's the same thing that we do in Christ. Sexual immorality dishonours and disregards Christ's presence in our life. And it harms the life and the flow of the Spirit within us. And that's why he's saying he's talking about unrepentant sexual sins. He says that's why it's a rejection of God himself because God is living inside of you and you are disregarding his presence in your life. And that's why there is a direct connection between spiritual crisis and sexual immorality. Paul warns them, he's warning them to live with the end in mind. Live with the end in mind, with eternity in mind. Because when a Christian makes peace with their sexual sin, when they justify it, when they sanitize it, their souls are in danger. We can only live divided for so long. And the enemy loves it. He wants to condemn us. He wants to draw us away from God. Now, as I said at the start, sex is one of the most powerful forces in life. None of us are immune to it. And so this message is not just for a few bad people here today. It's for all of us, all of us. So when you find yourself struggling, when you get caught off guard and, and you, you find yourself going down a road and you're like, oh, this isn't good, what do you do? What do you do if you're struggling today? If you struggle in the future, if you've struggled in the past, what do we do? Number one, we start by repenting. Start by repenting. Don't make peace with it. Don't justify it. Don't make it all sound good. Oh, at least we didn't do this or at least I didn't do that. But no, repent. Feel that sorrow before God. God, I know I haven't lived up to your holiness, what you've called me to. God, I want to honour you with my life, with my body. Remember, the blood of Jesus is sufficient to cover all sin, including sexual sin. And some of you might be here today and you're just you're feeling bad. You're feeling condemned. Let me read this scripture to you. It says, 1 John 1, 19, it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe today you're even feeling, uh, you're feeling uncomfortable or you're feeling bad because not because of what you've done, but maybe because of what someone has done to you. What I love about this scripture is it says, God forgives us whenever we sin, but he also cleanses us. He cleanses whatever we've done. He cleanses whatever they've done to you. Ephesians 4 verse 22, it says, throw off your sinful nature and your former way of life which is corrupted by lust and deception. And it's saying, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. This former life, it can't coexist with this new life in Christ. It's like having a shower and getting all clean. 
and then you go put your dirty clothes back on again. It can't go, it can't go together. Put off the old self. Confess your sins before God. Invite accountability. That's what we're here for as a church community, that we would pray and restore and walk with each other through our difficulties. If you can't do that, then seek professional help. The aim is do not make peace with your sexual sin. Do not invite it to stay in your life. We need to throw it away, not moderation, but putting it off completely. Ephesians 4.23 then says, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes that you would put on this new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. This is a spiritual battle. And in verse 8, it says that, that God has given you His Holy Spirit. And so this battle must be fought in dependence upon Him, not on your own, but with Him. And with His help, we need to, number two, create new pathways. Create new pathways in our mind, in our habits. They say that pleasure pathways are very well-worn paths. Think about it, you know, we unconsciously go to the snack cupboard. We unconsciously go to the fridge at different times. We don't even think about it. It's unconscious. And our pleasure pathways are like that. We just naturally go there. And so what we have to do with the help of the Spirit is interrupt those pathways, exchange those pathways for a new pathway that pleases God. This is the way that we get out of sin. This is the way that we get out of addiction. So you might be here today and and you have a problem with pornography. You know, what do you do? Well, you need to get serious about limiting your access. Look at the trigger points. What are those trigger points? And interrupt them with something else. Maybe you're you're dating or you're, you're seeing someone and you can't keep your hands off each other, your boyfriend, your girlfriend. What do you do? You decide you're only going to meet up in public places, that you're not going to spend time alone in, in someone's home or, or places or the cinemas where no one can see you or you're not going to drive, sit in cars alone together. These are all things that you can do. Talk about it together. How can you honour God as a couple before you marry? Maybe you're in an inappropriate relationship. Maybe you're dating someone, you're married to someone, but you've got a bit of an emotional thing going on on the side. Maybe you are physically involved with somebody else. Break it off. Come clean. Walk in freedom. Maybe today you've been dating or you've been together for a really long time and it's time to put a ring on it. Yeah, it's, you, it's time to get out of sin. It's time to choose holiness and it's time to get married. Amen? Yeah. If you are single, what do you do if you're single? What if that's your, your season? What if that's your life calling? What do you do? Well, John Stott, who I mentioned before, he's a theologian. He never married. He never had children. And he says this. He says that it is possible for human sexual energy to be redirected both into affectionate relationships with friends of both sexes and into the loving service of others. And so it's important in that season, in that life, to have healthy attachments, not to do it in isolation, to, and to, ha- to really get in touch with that calling from God to serve others. Whatever your situation is, whatever your temptation is, your sin, create a new pathway. Look at the triggers and put your pleasure under God's purposes so that you can please God with your life, within holiness and in honour. I wanna remind you today that you have victory over sin. If you are in Christ, then you have victory over sin. The problem is, is that we feel defeated by sin because often we are disobedient. We practise moderation, not abstinence. We try to allow just a little bit of it to come in. We justify just a little bit of it and then we struggle to get breakthrough. When we stop saying, oh, it's just so hard to change, it's just so hard to break and we admit that 
we're being disobedient, it can actually give us the courage and the boldness to take that step, to stop doing the thing that we know is displeasing to our God. Do it, stop doing the thing that we actually hate and, li- and live with the, the pleasure of God over our lives. As I close and I wrap it all up today, in this passage, what Paul is, is really asking us to do is to reflect God's character in our sexuality that we would reflect Him, that we would glorify Him in a world that is hurting and broken because of sexual immorality, that we would stand out, that it would distinguish and mark our lives to others. We have two choices. We can pursue pleasure above all. And we know that it will lead to pain. It will lead to brokenness or we can choose to please God. And we know that that leads to freedom. It leads to joy. It leads to wholeness because God is not trying to rob us of joy. He's not trying to rob us of pleasure. He wants us to know and experience more and more pleasure, more and more joy, more and more love more and more life and life more abundantly because that is who our God is. Why don't you close your eyes this morning? I wanna give you just a little bit of space to ask the Holy Spirit today, what are you speaking to me about? Maybe there's a, a situation Maybe there's a a temptation or maybe it's something completely different. But you know, you need to ask God, God, is this part of my life, is it pleasing to you? What is that next step that God is asking you to take in the walk that you have with Him? God, we thank you for your word today. We sense that Paul is like a personal trainer with us today. And he's urging us and he's putting pressure on us. But God, our heart is that we would honour you. That we would want to please you with every hidden part of our life. God, I pray that today that we would be we would come aware of of areas of our life where we're not defeated by sin. We've, We've just been disobedient. Maybe areas of our life where we've made peace with our sin and and we're feeling the effects of it. We're feeling the effects of it on our relationship with God. Maybe there's areas of our life that we know are not pleasing to you, but we see that it's our obedience that stands in the way, not God's heart towards you, but but our our inability to, to make that step that you're asking us to do. God, I pray that today would be the start of repenting before you, repenting, throwing ourselves on your mercy to be able to walk in your power and your grace that with the help of your Spirit, that you would give us wisdom and insight how we can interrupt those pleasure pathways, those pathways that have been leading to death and not life, those pathways that, have, that are unholy, they're not honouring, they're not loving to those that are in our life. And God, I pray today, that you would give us the courage to put our pleasure under your purpose so that we can glorify you in our world. Amen. With your eyes still closed, I wanna speak to those today that maybe do not know God. Maybe you're on that journey of faith. 
Maybe you're still making that decision. You're trying to weigh it up. Like, how much would I have to give up if I, if I choose Jesus? The thing is, is that faith starts with one step. Jesus, I trust you. I don't, I, you can't figure it all out. And then it becomes a walk. It becomes a gradual walk, working out of God's will and His, His plan for our life to become holy. Some people, they make this decision gradually. And then before they know it, they, they just lean on God and they love God. But others, others need an invitation. And so today I'm gonna give you an invitation to invite Jesus into your life. Do you know that Jesus has already chosen you? He chose you and He was thinking about you before you ever chose Him. He moves towards you in the middle of your mess. He moves towards you before you ever thought about Him. He died for you 2,000 years ago. And when He died, He died with you in mind. He died, He took the punishment for your sins so that when you came to this moment where you were given this invitation, where you would be thinking, I can't, how could God accept me? He's already answered the question and He said, I've already paid the price for you. And now the only thing that stands in the way of you walking into relationship with Him and taking that step is, it's you. It's your desire to, to push Him away. But today, if you are willing to say, I wanna make that decision to accept Jesus as the authority of my life, I wanna please God with my life. Maybe you have no idea what it all means, but you know that's the next step that you need to take. Would you raise your hand today? But all I'm, all I'm gonna do is pray with you. I'm not gonna embarrass you. If you say today, I see a hand at the back there. Yep. The question is right now, do you sense God knocking on the door of your life? Do you desire to let Him in and to take over? Yep, I see that those hands over there too. Yep, I see that hand back there. Wonderful. If beyond all reasoning, the answer is yes, and there's no rush, next week we'll invite you again. But if today you know this is your day to invite Jesus into your life, just quickly raise your hand and I'm gonna pray over you right now. Wonderful. Let's repeat this prayer all together. Jesus, today, I respond to you. I am a sinner. I have lived for myself and I need you to save me. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me and removing my sin on the cross. Thank you for shedding your blood and choosing me. I open up my heart, my life to your love and to your kindness. Today, I choose you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't we give a hand? to all those that responded to Jesus today. Why don't you stand to your feet?